justice of God and plead my cause against the nation that is faithless. From the deceitful and cunning rescue me, for you, O oh God, are my strength. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Grace to you and peace to God our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, and with your spirit. Brethren, let us acknowledge our sins and so prepare ourselves to celebrate the sacred mystery. I confess to Almighty God and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have greatly sinned in my thoughts and in my words, in what I have done and in what I have failed to do, through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. Therefore, I ask Blessed Mary, the Virgin, all the angels and saints, and you, my brothers and sisters, to pray for me to the Lord our God. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to a everlasting life. Oh. 
the second reading, a reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Romans. Brothers and sisters, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh. On the contrary, you are in the Spirit. If only the Spirit of God dwells in you. Whoever does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is alive because of righteousness. If the Spirit of the one who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, the one who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies also. Through his Spirit, dwell in you. The Word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come with her weeping, he became perturbed and deeply troubled and said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Sir, come and see. And Jesus wept. So the Jews said, See how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not the one who opened the eyes of a blind man have done something so that this man would not have died? So Jesus, perturbed again, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay across it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. But Martha, the dead man's sister, said to him, Lord, by now there will be a stench. He has been dead for four days. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And Jesus raised his eyes and said, Father, I thank you for hearing me. I know that you always hear me. But because of the crowd here, I have said this, that they may believe that you sent me. And when he had said this, he cried out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, tied hand and foot with burial bands, and his face was wrapped in a cloth. So Jesus said to them, Untie him and let him go. Now many of the Jews who had come to Mary and seen what he had done began to believe in him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. It happened to be that a man with not so many talents for this world, and seemingly not the talents that one would think one should possess to be bishop, was chosen to be a bishop. And not having many of the talents of this world, not knowing the Bible well, not knowing languages of the Bible, when it came time for him to choose the motto that he should have, as each bishop has a motto in his insignia and in his coat of arms, he turned to someone that was envious of him, that not knowing that this man was envious. And he asked him to choose a, a, a particular um, inscription from the Bible. He said, I don't care what it is, I just love the Gospel of John. And so, entrusting that to him, he was, of course, absolutely horrified to learn that when it came time for his motto, his coat of arms to be revealed, it was Dominus Utque Yam Fecit Erit, which means literally the words of Martha. Certainly, Lord, there is a stench. It is such that we realize that we can't necessarily trust everyone. We look to the People's Republic of China, who claims that they have under control and that the coronavirus is abated there. But these are communist people who have never cared for the West or for their Asian neighbors, anyone who was a communist. Can we really trust them? I don't think so. We look to the fact of these readings to whom we can trust, and that is our Lord, Jesus Christ. We see how he has influenced this family that he has been so close to, this family of two sisters and a brother, of Mary and Martha and Lazarus. And we see how Martha has come out of herself, that she exhibits Truly, in this gospel, those three preeminent theological virtues. She exhibits the virtue of hope when we look at how he asks her if, he, if she doesn't know that her brother will rise. And he said, she says, yes, I have hope that he will rise on the last day. She exhibits the virtue of faith when he asks her, if he believe, she believes in him, and she says, Yes, Lord, I have come to believe that you are the Christ, the one who is to come into the world. You are the Son of God. She has that faith that Peter first showed in his declaration of who Jesus was. 
And then she shows her charity. Let's not forget that she is that person to whom Jesus addressed the words, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is that Mary has chosen the better part, and she shall not be denied. Well, her sister Mary is consumed in grief and weeping in her home, and even though she knows that Jesus is coming, she does not get up to come to greet him. She does not leave her chair in her grief. Martha, however, goes back, having come to Jesus, returning to her sister to bring her sister to Jesus. An excellent point of evangelization. We are all called in charity to bring others to Jesus. And maybe, maybe never more so as now, when people are sadly not able to come to their regular churches of worship, are not able to receive communion, are not able to receive the sacraments. And we see how Mary then places her faith again in Jesus. And we see the brother, Lazarus, who is a symbol of what sin is and what sin does to us, that we are bound up, hand and foot, our faces tied up. And Jesus says, untie him and let him go. That is what the sacraments do for each of us. It unties us and fetters us from our sins and lets us go free to have truly a new lease on our spiritual life. We look to this beautiful gospel and these readings to inspire us. And we look to the beautiful responsorial psalm, which is that of 130. Out of the depths I cry to you. How appropriate in these days. Out of the depths I cry to you. And we, with the response, we recall that the Lord is full of redemption and mercy. A friend of mine who teaches uh, seminarians just recently shared with me the fact that a lot of the young seminarians will come to him and say it's very hard to pray the Psalms. It's very hard to pray the liturgy of the hours because I, it does, they don't speak to me. And he said very astutely, that's because you haven't actually suffered yet. When you suffer, then the Psalms leap out of the page and speak to you completely. So it is that all the Psalms speak to us when we have suffered. And those of you who are sacrificing at this time with the uh, coronavirus pandemic, certainly you should look to the Psalms for consolation and comfort. This particular psalm means the world to me because it was the psalm that was being chanted in beautiful, beautiful words by the religious sisters of the Little Sisters of the Lamb at the very moment my mother's last breath expired as I held her in, her, in my arms. Out of the depths I cry to you which is called the De Profundis. Out of the profound depths, we cry to you, O Lord, that this pandemic may, may be lifted from us. Who wasn't moved powerfully by watching and participating in prayer in the Holy Father's particular prayer and Urbi Urbi blessing the other day, asking God to spare the world from this pandemic? You know that it's difficult to accept suffering. And as strange as it is in these crazy times, even in the New York Times, one can sometimes find common sense. And so it is that in a column of a particular columnist who's making his passage slowly from Judaism to Christianity, he wrote, and I quote, suffering can be redemptive. We learn more about ourselves in these hard periods. The difference between red and blue don't seem as acute on the gurneys of the ER, but the inequality in the world seems more obscene when the difference between the rich and poor is life or death. He asks us pointedly in his column, yes, in the New York Times, these things that we have to look at in this passion time as we prepare to celebrate 
the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, his sacrificial passion, his suffering, that we enter into it in some way. Are you ready to die? He says, if your lungs filled with fluid a week from Tuesday, would you be content with the life you've lived? What would you do if a loved one died? Do you know where your most trusted spiritual and relational resources lie? And what role do you play in this crisis? What is the specific way you are situated to serve? Maybe the only way you are situated to serve is to pray for all the peoples of the world, to pray for those who are suffering even greater than you are maybe at this time. We recognize in these readings how we are full of hope, that beautiful second reading that speaks to us of the hope that it is in each of us because we are filled with the Spirit of God. No matter what happens to us, we are filled with the Spirit of God and it is his life that will be in us. But we still pray for those who are suffering. I think of this poor little girl, this baby girl, whose father I brought into the church, whose parents I officiated at their wedding here not too long ago, and whose father wrote me pleading for prayers, whose daughter is fighting for her life in Children's Mercy Hospital. Her name is Scout, just like that beautiful heroine in To Kill a Mocking. So I ask you to pray for her, for her parents, and for all who are especially suffering in any way, and to especially bring your prayers, to join them to all the prayers of all Christians throughout the world as we enter into these two weeks known as Passion Time, as we prepare next week to enter into that holiest of weeks, Holy Week, where our hope is indeed revivified by the saving power, the majesty of Jesus, even in his humbleness and his humility, in his human nature as he suffered for us. We recognize still his majesty as sovereign over us all. Holiness in your constant care. 
May the dying and dying folks meet Christ and judge. May they rejoice forever in the vision of your glory. For sinners and the neglectful, but in this time of reconciliation, may they return to Christ. Christ, our yesterday, today, and tomorrow, our Alpha and Omega, always in full of parishioners of holy angels perish, for whom this Mass is offered in your loving mercy. For ourselves, that God may last stir up in our hearts a version for our own sins. Grant, we pray, O Lord, that your people may turn to you with all their heart, so that whatever they dare to ask in fitting prayer, they may receive by your mercy. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Hear us, Almighty God, and having instilled in your service the teachings of the Christian faith, graciously purify them by the working of this sacrifice. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. With your spirit. Lift up your hearts. And lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and just. It is truly really right and just our duty and our salvation to always and everywhere to give you thanks. Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God, through Christ our Lord. For as true man, he wept for Lazarus his friend, and as eternal God raised him from the tomb, just as taking pity on the human race, he leads us by sacred mysteries to new life. Through him, the host of angels adore your majesty and rejoices in your presence forever. May our voices of pray join with theirs in one chorus of exalted praise. As we
to yourself. So let the rising of the sun to its setting make your sacrifice, may be offered to you. Therefore, Lord, we humbly implore you, by the same spirit, graciously make holy these gifts you have brought to you for consecration, that they may become the body and blood of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, at whose command we celebrate these in the streets. For on the night he was betrayed, he himself took bread, and giving you thanks, he said, Blessed, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. Similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice and gave you thanks. He said, Blessed, and gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of the The blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in the name of me.
Peace to the Lord be with you always. With your spirit. With your spirit. Let us pray. We pray, Almighty God, that we may always be counted among the members of Christ, in His body and blood we have communion, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Bow down to the prayer of the people. Bless the Lord your people who long for the gift of your mercy. 
and grant that what at your prompting they desire that they receive by your generous gift, through Christ our Lord. Amen. May Christ God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go and announce the gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. They block off the ark of the Defense and battle. Defense against the wickedness and snares of the devil. God, we you can we humbly pray. And do thou, the Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan. And all evil spirits prowl about the world, seeking to ruin their souls. Amen. And in the following song, I pray.